Did you miss our 2021 pediatric surgery update course? Well, don't worry. We're going to give you our favorite sessions right here on this podcast. I'm Rod. And I'm Ellen and Cisco. We're research fellows at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. This was a super important session. It's on colorectal surgery. All right, so I'm going to turn things over to Drs. Rebecca Rentia and Caitlin Smith. They're going to explain the consortium. I'm Rebecca Rentia. I'm at Children's Mercy in Kansas City, and I do quite a bit of pediatric colorectal surgery, and that's one of my interests and concentrations. And I'm joined by Dr. Caitlin Smith. I'm uh, Caitlin Smith. Um, I'm at Seattle Children's, and I'm the program director of the Reconstructive Pelvic Medicine program here. So here's the first case. You see a three-month-old with a history of an anorectal malformation with a rectobladder neck fistula. He presents two weeks after laparoscopic-assisted anorectoplasty. He has a colostomy and a mucous fistula. What's your next step in management? And so our first hot topic is anal dilations following posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, or the PSARP. As always, scroll down under the media player, you can find the links to the articles below. And what this study found in a single institution prospective randomized control trial is that they may not be needed. And so we know that there's a lot of psychologic trauma that goes um, with families having to perform the dilations on their newborn children or having to perform them on a young child. And there's literature suggesting that there is a component of psychosocial psychologic dissociation in a child on later testing. The length of follow-up in this study was 12 months. The PSARP um, had to be performed in a child under 24 months of age. It was a primary surgery, excluded cloaca as a diagnosis. The average PSARP was performed at five months and a stricture was defined as a Hagar dilator size of less than 10. So keep in mind that the standard Hagar dilator size for a newborn is gonna be about size 12. So a size 10 is two deviations less. So they looked at primary and secondary outcomes. And one of the questions that they asked is, what was the need for reoperation and additional surgeries in each arm of the study? In this study, there were 25 children and the types of malformations were evenly distributed. So the complexity of the children was about equal. There were strictures that um, were non-significant between both groups and essentially a heineke michelitz anoplasty, which is where a longitudinal incision is made toward the anus and then it's closed transversely to widen the diameter of the circle, was able to be performed. Some of the few that had to be done for stricture did have to be done under separate general anesthesia, but for children who had a colostomy, that stricture was able to be taken care of at the time of colostomy takedown. So what we see in this study is that the number of strictures is the same between groups, the number who needed anoplasties is the same, and the number of redo operations is the same between the two groups. And the number of patients who had rectal prolapse is consistent with the literature. So there is a really good case here to abandon doing dilations postoperatively for children with anorectal malformations. I would say that currently in practice, I do size the anus at two weeks and one month. And I believe a lot of surgeons really still need to understand what the diameter of the anoplasty is so that stooling can um, not be obstructed by a strictured anoplasty that's unrecognized. However, since the HM anoplasty is an option, and we know that for slightly older children, dilations really are even more traumatic than for neonates, and you're concerned that you might need to put the child under a general anesthesia, that would be the only time that I would consider now initiating full dilations. What would you say the current percentage of patients who require a strictureplasty at that, at that two month period? Probably about five, to 8%. And there's also in there the question always if there's prolapse, will it go away? But yeah, I would say about 5 to 8%. All right, so moving on to our next case. Let's say you have a female patient transferred to your hospital. She's 39 weeks. She is two and a half kilos. Physical exam is normal, except she has a short perineal body. And then the anal opening is actually anterior to the muscle complex, but it's still posterior to the labial folds. So then you size her up with the Hagar dilators. She's about a size six. You get a little bit of stool output when you do that. Then you're gonna work her up with an echocardiogram. You're gonna find out she has a PDA. She has a little bit of left to right flow. And then on a renal ultrasound, she has a little bit of hydronephrosis on the left. 
And then on her spine, she has a conus that terminates at about L1. Okay, so this infant now is in your NICU. What are you gonna do? So I'm, I'm a fan of doing dilations in the neonatal period and having the family um, be discharged as soon as possible to home. So this is a study looking at 30-day outcomes for patients with anorectal malformations with the perineal or rectovestibular fistulas who underwent repair. They divided it between early and late repair. Early the repair was defined as patients who underwent repair before they were six days old. Late repair was defined for patients who underwent repair between six and eight weeks of age. There were 291 patients in the study, 66 underwent early repair, and 231 underwent late repair. So what were the outcomes? The ultimate uh, conclusion was that 30-day complications are not statistically different between these two groups. Um, also looking at perineal and rectovestibular fistulas, early was defined slightly differently as 14 days uh, or younger, um, and then late was defined, late repair was defined as any time after 14 days old. 164 patients were looked at, 31 early and 133 late repairs. And also um, the conclusion of this paper was that no difference in 30 day outcomes in terms of complications. Okay, so assuming that this is a healthy baby, what do you do? Do you do the dilation, send them home? Is there an optimal age? What do you think? I think for the neonates, for the infants, the dilations are really well tolerated. Um, for patients who are up to even several months old, patients who have older repair, I avoid them in those age groups. Things that might push you to do it earlier would be a little earlier would be like if it's a formula fed infant who needs like caloric concentration and their stools are thicker, like you can delay for a definitely for like a breastfed infant um, until two to three months, that's fine. You really wanna get it done before they start solids also because that can make the dilation strategy at home, um, you know, much more difficult. So those are the things in terms of timing that I think of. All right, let's change gears. Let's talk about a different disease process. Let's talk about Hirschsprung disease. A three month old male presents to your clinic to establish surgical care. He has a history of total colonic Hirschsprung disease and has an end ileostomy. When would you recommend pull through? What the literature really shows is that there's a shift that's happening to a slightly earlier pull through. Okay, so what are the long-term outcomes? Do we have any novel surgical techniques? And I mean, just to kind of cover the basics, how do you even define a long segment? It's any disease that's proximal to the rectosigmoid colon for the majority of articles that were reviewed. So this is a pediatric surgery Hirschsprung interest group article, and it discusses how to talk about Hirschsprung disease with the pathology group in the operating room and in the studies. Um, and then a contrast study itself is very inaccurate um, and colonic mapping needs to be performed to determine the level of the transition zone. There was no superior operation or more common operation that was performed, although Duhamel and De Swens and Suave were kind of the top operations. So a lot of this kind of depends on the pediatric colorectal surgeon you talk to. I mean, Swenson, Suave, Duhamel. I mean, is there really one that is more superior to the other, more common than the other? That might vary based on the surgeon, but there are certainly no new novel surgical techniques, at least over the past several years. There's a potential for stem cell therapy, but that's still in its infancy. This article is about a hypermotility and skin rash protocol for patients with total colonic Hirschberg disease. It is published in the European Journal of Pediatric Surgery. So why is it important? Is it has a mixed population of children with total colonic Hirschsprungs, but it outlines very clearly why an early operation for total colonic Hirschsprungs is possible. And by early, I mean around the age of five months old. And why an operation at a slightly earlier age than toilet training for urine is possible is because if a child with an ileostomy is adequately prepared and the family is able to participate in learning to thicken up stool, then they are able to actually have a pull through that does not result in complete perineal skin breakdown and ultimately learn techniques that will help this child because this is one of the hardest groups to toilet train overall. Okay, so re regardless of the urinary continence, this is total colonic Hirschsprung. The, the question otherwise really becomes, um, I just always do it when the child is toilet trained for urine. I only do it at the age of four. And I think if you wait way too long to do a pull through, especially a total colonic, they will have horrible anal sphincter spasm and potentially horrible pelvic disease that makes keeping a pull through really challenging. 
So let's move on to case number four. This is a five-year-old boy with a rectoprostatic malformation, history of repair, but hasn't really followed since then. At that time in infancy, he also had a tethered cord repaired. Sacral ratio is 0.5. He comes to your clinic now with daily soiling, multiple times, still in diapers, ready to go to kindergarten in the fall, but doesn't really have the sensation or verbalize when he's ready to stool. You do your exam under anesthesia and you find that there's not a stricture and the anoplasty is actually pretty well centered. So what do you do? I think it's really um, challenging and especially as they often have had surgery and not necessarily been followed long term. Um, so this uh, study is out of the PCPLC looking at bowel management strategies in children with anorectal malformations. Um, it came out in uh, just last year. And I think this is a really important graph because it shows what percentage of, um, you know, even mild uh, and moderate anorectal malformation patients in this five to 12 year old group really need rely on enemas and lots of other bowel management strategies to stay clean when they're um, heading into school age. Overall looked at 624 patients um, that were in the PCPLC registry with all with uh, varying diagnoses of severity of anorectal malformation. Um, the majority of patients had constipation as their primary complaint, um, and only 40% uh, were toilet trained, which I think is a really important uh, note as well. For these patients, you really have to do long-term close follow-up, especially through the toilet training years, to make sure that you don't have issues like this. Point number five is the timing of pull through for Hirschsprung disease. All infants had to be diagnosed under one month of age. These were primary pull throughs less than 31 days or greater than 31 days. And what this study found was that preoperative enterocolitis was the same between both groups. Postoperative enterocolitis was the same and transition zone really was the marker if a child needed to be treated for constipation. Talking about disparities in um, patients in the colorectal population, um, obviously, we are well aware that there are non-clinical factors, race, ethnicity, and insurance status that are associated regardless of clinical variables with outcomes. This uh, data was presented at APSA this year um, and was recently accepted. This is another consortium study out of the PCPLC that looked at 525 patients um, and public insurance uh, was associated with decreased rates of urinary continence in ARM uh, patients. As always, you can find the articles linked below. We obviously need a lot more further studies to uh, investigate this. Um, my commentary on this would be is I wonder, um, since the PCPLC is made up of specialty centers, if we miss some of the race and ethnic disparities that exist since the patients who can afford to travel to one of these centers may be um, not captured, finding the patients that don't have the means to travel, I think is really important for us as a consortium. Okay, so the last topic is important concepts in cloacal reconstruction surgery. Overall, this picture here uh, shows that there are two different types of um, cloacal anomalies on that high pressure distal colostogram and the 3D cloacogram. Okay, so what about the surgical plan? I mean, what anatomic issues do you foresee down the road? The important points to take away that have really been published in the past couple years are that the a urethral length of about two and a half centimeters has been measured in a lot of VCUGs of normal females. And so about 1.5 centimeters is needed. If a urethra that is too short is pulled past the bladder neck, there is a risk for incontinence. So understanding that even for a short channel can change your operative management. A short vagina, even in a very, very otherwise shorter common channel operation may require a vaginal replacement. And then finally, rotational fluoroscopy and 3D reconstructions are key to being able to make reliable measurements for anatomy. So there you have it, the PCPLC update from the 2021 Pediatric Surgery Update course. We reviewed a number of different things, including whether or not dilations after, are needed after PSARP, what's the best time to do the repair for either anorectal malformations or for Hirschsprung disease, and we found that similar outcomes, whether we do an early or delayed PSARP for anorectal malformations or pull through for Hirschsprung disease. And we talked about a few other things like bowel management strategies for patients with anorectal malformations. Hopefully you learned something here. 
If you like what you heard, be sure to follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and download the Stay Current and Pediatric Surgery app. Until next time, I'm Ellen. I'm Rod. And remember, knowledge should be free.